Welcome back to Tech Brews, I'm Andy. So everybody's jumping on this foldable bandwagon, huh? Everyone sees how cool and useful and futuristic they are now. I've been saying it since day one. I'm a day one foldable advocate. When the Samsung Fold was announced, I stood in line to be the first person to rock one. $2,000, you say? Not a problem. Here you go. Whatever, dude. Whatever. Peace. God bless. All right, I'm completely full of shit. I laughed at the first Fold. I was like, who the hell's going to want one of these weird phones with a small outer display that's pretty much useless? And then they started to get better, and I doubled down. Who wants a brick in their pocket, I would say? And then they got better and better. Now everyone's making one, and even the smaller little flip phone style ones. And all I keep thinking now is I want them all. So I bought the Fold 4 and the Flip 4, and I've been using them both for a few months now, and I'm loving my new foldable lifestyle. Don't judge me. You wish you could fold. You wish you had flex mode. You wish you could multitask with ease, but you can't, can you? All right, I'll calm down. Anyway, my new obsession with foldables led me to explore all they have to offer. One gripe I have with the Fold 4 is the same one I've had since the first iteration, the outer display. It's too narrow and tall. So I was intrigued when I found a company that was going the other way with their design. Which brings me to the Oppo Find N2. I've been using this phone for a few weeks now. I ordered it from GizTop for $1,500. It's the Chinese version. There's no global version available just yet. So when you order from GizTop, they're gonna open the phone and load it with all the Google mobile apps on it for you. And it'll take about 10 days to get it, depending on which shipping option you choose. So let's get the tech specs shit out of the way that nobody cares about. Feel free to skip ahead 30 seconds. So I chose the green version. It also comes in white and black. The black version has this vegan leather back instead of glass. And I really kind of wish I would have ordered that because I've never had a phone with a vegan leather back or any kind of different back than glass. So it's rocking the Snapdragon 8 Plus Gen 1 with 256 gigabytes of storage and 12 gigabytes of RAM. And it's running Android 13 with a color OS skin. The front and back are Gorilla Glass Victus wrapped in an aluminum frame, has a 4500 milliamp battery with 67 watt ultra fast charging and a 10 watt reverse wired charging. So here's the things I like about it. Let's start with the design. Unlike the Fold 4, I tend to use the outer display more than I use the inner. The wider outer display is 5.5 inches and it's perfect size for one-handed use. It's like having a wide-body iPhone mini, but with a 120Hz AMOLED display that's one of the most gorgeous displays I've ever used. It feels more like a normal phone when you're typing or scrolling through social media. Open up the phone and you'll find a beautiful 7.1 inch AMOLED display that's also 120Hz. One thing you'll notice immediately, or I should have said don't notice, is the crease. It's almost non-existent. You can feel it when you're dragging your finger across the display, but it's far less dramatic than that of the Fold, which is something that you see all the time at the right angle. I don't care what anyone says, the crease never goes away. You don't notice it less. I think you just get used to it and accept that you've chosen the foldable lifestyle. The best part of having the bigger inner screen is being able to multitask. Having two apps open at the same time is great. I love to have YouTube open on one side and Twitter on the other. So app continuation is a nice feature as well, and it's done a little better than Samsung. When you're using an app like Kindle or YouTube on the inner display and you close the phone, you can swipe up on the front display to continue the app or just go on with your business and you won't have to worry about your phone being unlocked and apps running in your pockets like on the Fold. I know I can shut that off, but I love the continuation and I think Oppo has found a great way of implementing that. When closed, the Oppo closes completely flat and there isn't a big gap at the bottom like the Fold has. That's not something that really bothers me with the Fold, but for some reason it bothers other people and they talk about it constantly. It is cool to see the Oppo close flat though. I'm sure the next iteration of the Fold will do the same. The Oppo kind of reminds me of an old school wallet in its size. It feels like a wallet, you know, like an old school wallet, not one of these rich wallets, like one your dad used to have, a big leather one with like 50 credit cards in it. 
in all of your class pictures. Remember when people used to carry around pictures? <laughs> pictures of people. But they just shoved them in their butt. Like, you know, and they were like, hey, I like this person. And I'm going to put it in this wallet and I'm going to shove it and I'm going to fart all over it. <laughs> Alright, that, that's stupid. I guess people fart on their phones still. Uh, it's probably not seeping in. Do a stand up now. Pull it out of their back pocket, pull out your picture of you, and they'd be like, here he was when he was seven. And you know, he's been just farting on that picture <laughs> for at least 10 years. It's just all wrinkled up. And anyway. So on to security. The Find In has great biometrics, including a face unlock from the cover and inner display cameras, and a fingerprint scanner and the power button. Both have worked flawlessly for me, and I'm very impressed with the face unlock. So the buttons on the side are placed perfectly. When I first started using it, I thought they were a little too high, but when you take into account that most people are going to be holding it with two hands with the inner display open, they're just in the right spot for using the fingerprint scanner and the volume rocker when you need it. On the Fold 4 in landscape, if you're using the slim stand case that's made by Samsung, the volume rocker and the fingerprint scanner are facing down and impossible to get to without picking the phone up. Honestly, on Android in general, I wish they had a swipe over feature from the edge to change the volume. Maybe there's a setting I don't know about, so let me know in the comments if you figured out an alternative. Next up is possibly the best thing about this phone, the cameras. It has an amazing Hasselblad triple camera setup boasting a 50 megapixel wide with OIS, a 32 megapixel telephoto with two times optical zoom, and a 48 megapixel ultra wide that will shoot up to 4K 60 frame per second video. Let me tell you, the photos and videos from this thing are amazing. My wife is a professional photographer and is always my camera tester and she was thoroughly impressed with it. Here's a few of the photos she took over the last few weeks. Now the front selfie camera and the inner display camera are no slouches either. Both are 32 megapixel and take great portrait photos, but why would you use them when you can just use the enhanced selfie mode feature of the phone, which, like the Fold 4, allows you to use the cover display as a viewfinder so you can take advantage of those main cameras on the back for some of the best self-portraits. Another nice feature is being able to hold your hand up to the camera and it'll count down from three to take a photo without you having to reach up and touch the shutter button. So there's also an AI function in the camera system that will suggest portrait mode if it detects a face, it tells you that it can scan documents or search text, and to some extent identify different objects in the scene like green plants and kitties. Although it isn't very good at that part, my dog is also a kitty, pictures of the kids are kitties, it identified my wife's bare breast as an infant, yeah, you get the point. Second to the cameras is the ultra fast charging. It comes with a 67 watt power brick and a USB-A to USB-C cable, and it'll charge the phone from zero to 100% in 42 minutes. What I love about fast charging is say you're coming home from work after a busy day, you have to get cleaned up and head right back out for dinner, but your battery is low on your phone. You can plug it in and in five minutes, you'll get over 20% more battery. which is another couple hours worth of use. Like I said, give me fast charging or give me death. Was that George, what did we say that was? John Adams. Huh? Patrick Henry. Patrick Henry. And now the things I don't like so much. Being that it's a Chinese only phone, the setup is not very easy. It's not like buying a phone made specifically for North America. This is not something that I would just buy for my parents and be like, hey, good luck. It's not like going out to Best Buy and getting a new iPhone and taking the SIM card out of your old iPhone and putting it in the new one and then restoring it from the iCloud backup because that's super simple. This is not that. 
You have to download all your apps, change the permissions and set them to run in the background, change notification settings on each one to allow you to get your push notifications on your lock screen, and then you'll still only get them sometimes. What I'm saying is, it's a huge pain in the ass. Once you get it set up the way you like it, the phone works great mostly, except for SMS. It seems to work fine with the stock messaging app and sending messages, but sometimes you don't receive them, but it'll never send MMS no matter what I do. It's even worse with Google messages. So if you buy this phone, I would just plan on getting a secondary messaging app like Facebook Messenger or Signal. Obviously this could vary depending on which carrier you have. I'm using Google Fi, which mostly uses T-Mobile network where I am. Next up is ColorOS. ColorOS seems half-baked and kind of takes Android 13 back a few generations. It's clunky and buggy. I like the aesthetic of it, but that's about it. I would add a launcher to it if I were gonna be using it long-term, but oh wait, you can't really do that either. So that sucks too. Also, apps crash and they're very quirky, but that's not necessarily the phone's fault. Most of the apps I use most likely aren't optimized to run perfectly on ColorOS, but still it gets annoying having apps freeze up or just close and not reopen again until I restart the phone. The last part's gonna be just me ranting with no end in sight. It has no water and dust resistance rating. Even though I never plan on dropping my phone in the ocean or throwing it in the lake again, or sitting in the rain using it as a little umbrella, life happens. So it'd be nice to know that your $1,500 device would be somewhat protected from the elements, but this one is not. So if you do drop in the sink while watching YouTube and doing the dishes, or if your asshole brother decides to push you into the pool because he's had too many Bloody Marys before noon, you will be left with just a fancy brick instead of a fancy brick phone. And the borders around the inner display are too big and seem to get in the way when you're using gestures. They stick up a little too high and they're kind of sharp edged. It's not a great feeling at all. If you told me they were doing it this way because it made it waterproof, then I'd be like, oh, okay, it seems worth it. But it doesn't, so why, just why? Plus the screen doesn't seem responsive. Multiple taps sometimes just to get what you want like a damn caveman. Second. I I'm sorry, Your Honor. I was listening to the magic voices coming out of this strange modern invention. Also, there's no fucking wireless charging. $1,500, people. My $300 nothing phone, video coming soon, has wireless charging. So what's the excuse here? I mean, I'm all for super fast wired charging, but sometimes you want to throw the damn thing on a charger without having to think about it and have it do its thing. Come on, Oppo, you can do better. And last but not least are the speakers. They sound okay and they get pretty loud, but they're both on the same side of the casing. So when it's in landscape, they're both firing down and in portrait, they're both firing to one side or the other. Because of this, it's not stereo sound. When it's in flex mode, watching YouTube, they both just shoot out of one side and out into space for the aliens to hear, I guess, because it certainly isn't for me. So in conclusion, I give the Oppo Find N2 an Andy foldable phone rating of 8.7 out of 10, because this all really matters. I really love the design and the unboxing experience was amazing. And from what I've seen, they've improved it a lot from the first Find N, but there are still a few things I would like to see changed before it can overtake the Fold 4 in my opinion. Should you buy one of these? If you live in China, yeah, you should. If you live in North America, no. I think you should hold off until Oppo releases the Find N3, and hopefully it's a global version and possibly a true competitor to Samsung for the world foldable domination. That is if they beat the Pixel Foldable and the eventual Apple folding phone to market. Either way, I love seeing more and more companies dipping their toes into the crease of the fold. If you've enjoyed this video, make sure you like and subscribe and comment and tell your friends and family and your significant others and dogs and cats and ferrets and gerbils. Thanks for watching. Get out of here. 32 megapixel telepo- Oh my god. A papa topa tapa topa. God damn, I had it too. Over here and punch me right in the mouth. Why can't I read? It's my shit. I'm gonna do this like 10 times cause I'm done. Why can I not say carrier? That's why it's fucking me up cause I spelled it wrong. Oh, it's me. I'm just being a person. Why did I put if there? I'm gonna punch this thing in the face. In the face. See, I can't say it. Carrier. Carrier, carrier. Carrier. Obviously. Obviously, you dumb fuck. I can't say carrier. If you live in North America, nah, probably not. <laughs> nah. It's your money. No.